돼요. 아, oh, participants, yes, that's growing. Well, good evening everybody. This is the talk on John Barron. Uh, we've got a few minutes till we are due to start and we are still waiting for a good number of people to sign in. So if you can bear with us just for a few minutes before we get going. I went on an inspirational walk last evening to Round Hay Park. <laughs> ah, is that where you took the photograph on your first slide? <laughs> um, and I took that on another occasion. Mm. Um, there are a couple from last evening are in the presentation, but it was Lovely. absolutely gorgeous, you know, to, uh, over the time of sunset. Um, unfortunately, the moon rises so late these days, you know, just after the full, it's, you know, it's too late, but anyway, it was lovely. Well, I spent part of the morning in Adel Woods, which is a wonderful place to be. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. fantastic. We do have some marvellous green spaces within the boundary of Leeds now. So well, it's the, the, sort of the city, the cities of ecologists told me that there's a greater biodiversity in Adel Woods than there is anywhere else in Leeds. Gosh. Some of it natural and partly sort of helped along by um, sort of human activities. It's certainly a wonderful place and there's so many paths, you can, <laughs> one can get lost. <laughs> um, I'm just going to greet uh, James from Round Hay. Uh, hello there. <laughs> I hope there are some others from Round Hay. No doubt there will be people who know Round Hay extremely well who will be able to give me extra info and indeed probably take delight in correcting some things that I, I maybe I've got the wrong end of the stick on, but anyway, I hope not, but... I just can't envisage how much I learned just from going out on a ge geological tour of Round Hay, which was a few years ago, but I think, well, I hope they're still being conducted, those tours. Fascinating. Well, yes, indeed, um, there's the geology trail leaflet, isn't there? I've not actually been on the, the, the one, a tour led by a geologist, but I should. <laughs> it's um, Lynn up from London saying hello to everyone. That's nice. Oh, Sue Rathmel, gosh, hello there. Uh, the copy of the uh, the new Pevsner, the new Pevsner 2005 is almost worn out, Sue. <laughs> I've used it a great deal over these last years. Yeah, and that's... Yes, Pevsner, I wonder quite how they found all that, you know, produced all that scholarship in such a relatively short space of time, really. Mm, yeah. Wonderful set of work. Yeah, amazing. Amazing. Leeds Lass living in Walsden. Right, well, hello to uh, Deb, the Leeds Lass in Walsden. <laughs> I'm not sure I've got time before our start time to... Uh, oh, here's Clive saying hello as well. I, I'm not sure we've got time to greet everybody, but it's really nice to know who's there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> yeah, there are some familiar, some familiar names on, on, on the list. Yeah, great, lovely. And still um, crowding through the door um, after six yeah. o'clock, but anyway. Yes, we'll wait for another couple of minutes or so until yeah. um, we get going properly because there are still people joining. Hmm. Uh, could anybody uh, put something in the chat if you think that my voice isn't isn't uh, clear enough to you? I think we've got it set so that the microphone is working okay. It's all oh, right. Thank you, Steve. That's uh, that's good to know. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> you can't say further than that. <laughs> Yes, you can't get much better than that. Um, it's an exaggeration. <laughs> All right. One from Canterbury. I assume that's Canterbury, Kent, which is my part of the world, rather than Canterbury, New Zealand, or any other Canterburys that we have. May I just point out to everybody while we're waiting? Um, <laughs> This is not gin and tonic. This is elderflower, homemade elderflower cordial um, in homage to Baron, who was a teetotaler. Well, I made some homemade elderflower cordial and it didn't last more than two weeks before I finished it all off. Ah. It was delicious. Mm. Elderflowers from the Harewood estate. Mm. Well, on a, on a public footpath, but within the yeah. Harewood estate, I think. Yes, well, it's good to get the blossoms from somewhere that's not next to a road, isn't it? Well, there are some superb bushes right on the A61 through through Harewood, but you mm. avoid them like the plague. Mm. Mm. Oh, I'm difficult to hear. All right. I've been told that before, to be honest. I shall speak up. Thank you for being for referring to me as a gentleman. Doesn't always happen. <laughs> Yes, wait for a few more to join, then we'll get going. Ah, hmm. uh, yes. I think we appear to have come to a kind of plateau here, so maybe we'll start properly. So, I hope everyone can hear me clearly. And good evening. To everyone, my name is Roderick Parker, introducing this session on behalf of the Leeds Civic Trust. I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of, of the Trust. The talk this evening is one of a series on people who are commemorated by Civic Trust blue plaques in Leeds. And our subject, Sir John Barham, was one of the most influential figures in Victorian Leeds in the industrial and civic and social life of the city. And we can see his mark or his marks to this day. And I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Rachel Unsworth, who is going to give this talk. Now, Rachel, by background, is an urban geographer. She lectured in geography at the University of Leeds for 20 years from 1994 and is now a freelance researcher, writer, editor and a tour guide. She looks at Leeds both past, present and its future. So may I pass the control of this session on to Rachel to give us a, a talk on Sir John Barron. Thank you, Roderick. Now I've just got to go through the slightly laborious thing of um, sharing my screen, um, including declaring that I'm not a robot. Here we are. Should be able to pick it up quite quickly now. None of us are robots. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Opening it in Zoom and going to presentation mode. And here we are. I hope. And then pick up my cute little laser pointer. So as, as Roderick says, um, a man certainly to be celebrated. We have a double reason this year. And not only is he a um, recipient of a blue plaque, but it's uh, 200 years since he was born. And it's exactly 150 years since he secured Rante Park for the town. So uh, celebrations of many kinds. So it was um, a while back that uh, the plaque was put up on um, 
the later factories, those of you who know your Leeds bricks will actually re recognise that this is uh, on the Chorley Lane factory, not the one in Park Square, St Paul's Street. So he's, uh, there wasn't uh, enough room on the plaque, as with many <laughs> plaques, to put all, all that um, he should be lauded for. He was born uh, not in this town, but elsewhere, and like so many people, was attracted to come here because of the opportunities. And he didn't come on the new route <coughs> from London to Derby and then change to come to Leeds. He came in the more old fashioned way, but then he did get the newfangled train from Selby and presumably arrived at Marsh Lane Station um, and, uh, and arrived into this um, extraordinary fast growing place that had already reached uh, over 150,000. Um, chaotic, rapid growth that had um, already um, benefited from some changes at national level. And um, just note the state of the, the cloth and tailoring industry. I mean, cloth was huge, but at this stage, there was hardly um, a, a, a tailoring industry as such. There was a small scale tailoring, but uh, the ready-made clothing industry was yet to come. And although it was a place of, of opportunity for um, a young man who had plenty of ambition and uh, entrepreneurial zeal and was hardworking, uh, it was also a place with some significant difficulties. Steve Burt, in his forthcoming book on Hunslet, uh, suggests that perhaps the early 1840s were the toughest times for trade in the whole of the century. So this was, um, you know, d a difficult set of circumstances he was coming into, much unrest because of the way that the factory system was uh, treating this growing workforce in these new circumstances. And the town was by no means on top of all the facilities and management that was required uh, for a, a place of the size that it had already become. So it was into this that Baron arrived. And, um, oh yes, this is just a, a little a quote from a journalist uh, saying, you know, that uh, yeah, really not, uh, not a fine place. Uh, you know, he was, he's not giving a great encomium about Leeds here. Uh, uh, emphasizing just how difficult living and working conditions must have been for the majority. But uh, Baron soon established himself. He married the daughter of a draper and he, uh, together with her, had six uh, sons and four daughters within 15 years. Um, and uh, he, he himself, by the way, was a um, third a child of his father, a gunsmith in London, and he'd obviously decided he was going to come and establish himself in a different place and make a life for himself. So here he is, making his life, marrying at the New Baptist Chapel, and um, then establishing himself. First, he'd, he'd uh, found work with a pawnbroker and clothes dealer. Maybe this gave him the idea that there was work to be done in selling clothes to, first of all, labourers and then a wider market. And he got premises down here on the uh, the corner of Brigham and Swinegate and Leeds Bridge is just down here. Um, I've used the Massa map because it has numbers on it so we can see where we are at very fine detail. It's just this one map from 1844. So we can also see where he had his first workshop when he decided to branch out into making clothes rather than just selling them. So this is number six, Alfred Place. So we get the number from Massa we get the fuller address and more detail from the slightly later map, the first of the Ordnance Surveys, and that's where his premises were. He was uh, apparently very popular with uh, farmers and others coming to market in Leeds. And um, this is where Alfred Street was then, but this is uh, just to show you where it is now. I can never resist doing one of these. So. Uh, the premises, and now, uh, what's the Trinity car park? So, uh, moving on. Um, so, he was one of the very first to invest in this newfangled Singer sewing machine that was only invented in the early 1850s. And he had apparently 20 or 30 of these machines when he uh, had his workshop in Alfred Street. 
Um, so the sewers could crack on, but um, it wasn't until uh, he was able to invest in another kind of new machinery that uh, he was able to really uh, increase efficiency and the scale and pace of, of his output. So he saw at a furniture fair in the later 1850s an example of a band knife that was for cutting layers of veneer of wood for furniture making. And he got a local firm, uh, Greenwood and Batley, and, and then B and Beecroft to work on providing him with something that would cut layers of cloth. So here you, you can see uh, the machine at work. And so instead of just painstakingly cutting one pair of trousers at a time or one jacket at a time, this could cut out layers of up to 20 um, uh, pieces of cloth simultaneously. So that was a, a real breakthrough. So he didn't invent that machine, but he did uh, apply it to an already thriving business. And um, growing as he was, he uh, realised that it was necessary to move. So um, here, here he comes to Park Row, into bigger premises. And by now, alongside him is his eldest son, another John Barron. <clears throat> and these changes reflect and enable the expansion of the business. And we know that in the first couple of years here, their stock increased um, by 50%. And together, father and son developed and patented new machinery, making the processes more efficient all the time. So this was a, a very go-ahead firm um, growing apace. And uh, with the family growing too, as well as his income and his ways of doing business, he was able to uh, live up here in Chapel Allerton. So he bought the hall about 1864 and set about uh, making improvements there um, and uh, uh, it was a, a you know very fine place to live up out of town so he understood about the benefits of being out of uh, the the filthy dirty noisy smoky place that Leeds was by then and it had extensive grounds now this map points the wrong way so I'm just going to swing it around um, so you can see the the hall up here and these extensive grounds, which late, much later got sold off, but this was about 37 acres. Now, this isn't a, a, a big estate uh, by standards of, of uh, older times, uh, but you know he knew what it was to have plenty of space to live in and for his recreation time and for the family. So he, at the same time as developing his business and raising the family, he took on various civic roles. So look at this, he started being a councillor back in the early 1850s. And actually he carried on in civic roles right up until the end, not all of them simultaneously, but uh, his, as his stature grew and he went up from being councillor to alderman to mayor and then on to these other roles, including being MP for two uh, separate sessions. Uh, he was obviously a trusted and uh, increasingly experienced person who knew how to make all sorts of things work. We don't have many pictures of him. This is one from near the end of his life. And uh, the portraits, uh, other portraits are taken from this. So uh, as well as being a, um, a councillor dealing with all sorts of uh, matters in the town, he was particularly interested in improving the quality of um, this, the uh, urban environment. Um, so Boar Lane, here still at its narrow, in its narrow state, um, was to be widened. And the technique to be used to pay for this was that in demolishing all the properties on the south side, that land was to be sold off and the proceeds used to fi finance the widening of the street. So this was uh, how it looked before widening. You see, it's only a really narrow street. And then once it had been widened, this is a more recent picture. So this is about three times the width. So a lot of work to do that. Um, and uh, he was, you know, it was a big scheme, but he was up for it. Um, and in the process managed to uh, corner for himself this uh, important corner shop, One Ball Lane. So he moved from one brigade, a corner spot, to One Ball Lane. And later on, this was a technique that was to be picked up by, by Burton. Uh, in his tail tailoring business when he had a, a very large network of shops. And in fact, on the corner that, uh, you know, the artist behind Grimshaw's left shoulder, as it were, was a, a, a shop location that was later to be taken by Burton. 
So I'm sure most of you recognize that without even seeing the attribution of the painting. And this fine street still exists today. And it's what Janet Douglas in her appraisal of uh, the architecture of the times describes as a delightful skyline of molded parapets, dormers, statuary and spiky turrets. And um, oh, by the way, the Civic Trust kicked up a big fuss in the 1970s when this, this was in danger of being demolished and replaced. So um, we have the trust to thank for that and, and many other such actions uh, coming to the rescue of some of our built heritage. It includes, by the way, this very much uh, in the tradition of the, the traders of Venice. And it included the rebuilding of the old Griffin Hotel for making it fit for the railway age. And there was also the rebuilding of the Golden Lion just on the spot where he'd had his first shop. So the old hotel, the coaching inn had been extended and then and rebuilt on this site. Who did all this work? Well, all of the, the buildings that I, the new buildings I've shown you so far were by this architect, local man born to a, uh, a machine maker down in um, down in um, uh, Holbeck, and uh, he was a, a friend and political ally of John Barron, uh, a liberal, and not an Anglican. We don't know quite what he was, but he wasn't an Anglican. Um, and he had an education, including going to the Leeds School of Design, where he was a gold medal winner. And in his early career, he spent much time on trying to design improved kinds of housing for the working classes. So it wasn't all about villas for the folk who've made pots of money in Leeds. He was trying to you know, do his bit for improving the town in other ways. Um, and uh, these were his offices in Park Place for many years. He had, a, had smaller offices before that and then established himself in Park Place in the 1860s. The building's still there. Then came his big commission from John Barron, his friend and ally. And um, this is, uh, it was just here in Park Square. They demolished eight houses quite uh, audaciously to create this warehouse and factory building for the um, this growing business. It's said to be in Moorish Venetian merchant style and to be influenced by the Alhambra in Granada, Spain. And he started though with um, principles about the activities to be accommodated um, as, as well as thinking about the fact that he didn't want just to have another six story uh, typical mill building. This was going to be something different. This is in the era of using buildings as part of your marketing uh, to make a, a name for yourself in, and, uh, and stand out from, from others. And so this was uh, you know, using decorations borrowed, borrowed from uh, palaces and, and cathedrals and, and more. And in here, there were 200 sewing machines, so cutting and pressing rooms and warehouse facilities and a showroom. So um, quite extraordinary that in a residential square in the Georgian West End, there was then this factory. And it was the earliest use in Leeds, as far as we know, of the Dalton Terracotta from London. This is Dalton's own premises, showing off their, their wares in their own premises. And this is the very fine southeast side of the building, the doorway, very much uh, influenced by Moorish notions here. Um, and uh, sadly altered during the reno renovations, the change of use to offices in the 1970s. However, Fortunately, it wasn't demolished. They started demolishing it, but then again, it, it had a reprieve. And um, it's just that the minarets apparently are not the originals because they'd already started to take them down. So they are fiberglass copies, I'm told reliably. Um, and this, even the subsidiary entrance was, was rather grand, wasn't it? So it um, also had uh, modern facilities that weren't available to the workforce in other such factories. A uh, dining room, modern sanitation, it was lighter and airier than other places. And this notion that it was a good thing to have a happier and healthier workforce had obviously um, uh, you know, been an influence. And uh, he helped to break the mould with the, the really uh, grim, you know, the, the dark satanic mills style of, of um, building. 
and and to make the town more beautiful in the process. So since the town hall opening 20 years before this, there had been other additions to the urban landscape that were fine, but perhaps nothing as fine in the commercial line as this since uh, Marshall's Temple Works. Some of the types of garments made there, we know, well, it was mostly menswear and children's clothes, boys' clothes. There was a popularity for uh, the little sailor suits because uh, Queen Victoria had dressed up her eldest son in such a suit way back when he was a lad. And so this is a, um, a, a serious little Leeds boy, no doubt, modelling the Baron equivalent. And then there are examples here of the clothing that they produced. I dare say little boys tended to wear out their jackets and trousers and I don't know how many actual um, garments we have left now. But we do have evidence of um, how some of these garments were produced. Not all of the processes were done in that fine factory in the West End. Um, there was also use made of the out, um, outworking. And in this area of Leylands, um, increasing numbers of Jewish immigrants were settling, many of them tailors already, and they turned their skills towards um, supporting the, the now burgeoning garment industry in Leeds. And um, this chap, Herman Friend, um, he pioneered even taking the division of labor down to the level of the little workshops and getting people to specialize in particular tasks so that they would get very speedy at it. And, and then the whole process would be more rapid. So such as buttonholing or making the pockets or the padding or whatever it was. So there, there were hundreds and hundreds of people working in this area and as it crept further north, supporting Barron's business and other businesses. So they grew so rapidly that they needed more premises. And again, Ambler was called into action and uh, moved just to the north, a little bit west and to the north, uh, to near Woodhouse Square and um, Chorley Lane Mills. All these illustrations are from this wonderful book. I'll, I'll show it uh, at, at the end, but this was about the centenary of the firm. So when they moved to um, Chorley Lane, expanded to Chorley Lane, they were about halfway through their um, run to 1951. And this is the sort of um, garments that uh, the, the firm was showing off about in that book. Obviously not all from 1951. They're not dated and there's no, um, there's no other information in the book about when these photographs were taken or anything. So we just uh, have these rather extraordinary pictures with no attributions. So the, it then became one of the biggest uh, factories anywhere um, when it was f fully developed. And there's the blue plaque, by the way, you can see it there on the, the fine doorway of Chorley Lane. So not all the, um, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, so here we've got the, the, just the process coming through from the cloth arriving in the stockroom, all being carefully labeled up and put in the right places so it could then go on its way to the right cutters and sewers. Um, this is part of the process that before the, the band knives are, are used. It must be, you know, doing the paper patterns and then uh, doing the trial garments. And then when they're being done at scale, that's when they could have the layers of cloth being put through these, these band knives. Vast cutting room here, all, by, all done by men, you notice. This is one of the points that Katrina Honeyman makes in her book about the garment industry, well suited, that uh, there was very much a division. So all men in the cutting room and all women here in the sewing room, making a right old clatter with whatever era of Singer sewing machines they were now on, trying to make improvements all the time uh, to increase the, the speed, accuracy, and um, and to add other, other um, kinds of specialist equipment all the time as well. And here we have the clothes ready for dispatch in the warehouse section. So the largest factory in the world at, it, at its peak at 156,000 square feet to be overtaken by others later. Burton then in the 20s became the largest factory all in this same line of work. And then later on, um, uh, uh, a son of Barron's took over the business and after he uh, retired, then a, a younger brother took over as well. But um, the firm didn't um, uh, last in this, this form past the era when so many of the firms um, ceased business. So after a couple of takeovers, actually, 
um, Barron's, uh, uh, the part producing school uniforms became part of the company that's still going, I believe, but um, not, not in its uh, original form. So um, then we come to this great work that he did to secure the park for the people. This was taken back in the winter on a very sunny um, winter's day. Um, and uh, it's an amazing story how this came into the hands of the City Council, the people of Leeds. I'm not going to tell that story exhaustively. I'm, I, there isn't time this evening and, I, and I, I'm saving some of this for when I do the tour um, at the weekend. I'm doing 10 o'clock and again at uh, half past two. Um, to uh, two, two o'clock, oh gosh, I can't even remember. Uh, anyway, morning and, af and afternoon on Sunday, uh, doing tours of, of Round Hay Park. Um, so this had been a Norman hunting park, uh, sort of fenced in uh, around its perimeter to keep the deer in. It had also been exploited in various other ways, not just for game, but for coal, for stone, for clay. Uh, for timber and then by this stage almost stripped of its timber it was um, turned over to, to farming so um, the I'm not going to go through all the the people who'd owned it over the years I and mean, it's a, a complicated story but um, by the time that uh, Thomas Nicholson and Samuel Elam uh, were in a position to buy it it was um, it was pretty much, um, you know, a denuded landscape that needed a lot of work to turn it into a fine place to live. Now, shortly after the two of them had bought this property with um, Nicholson buying the northern portion and Elam buying the southern area, Elam fell on hard times and then he died. And so the, that his portion came back on the market and Nicholson was able to pick up even more acres uh, with which he was then able to make um, his extremely fine country estate. So a great deal of work went into uh, capturing the waters of a, a couple of streams, two or three streams uh, to make the upper lake here and the lower lake. And he used the labor of demobbed soldiers at the end of the Napoleonic Wars to, to dig the lake. Um, some of the spoil must have gone into making the dam here. And um, then he, he was able to um, create uh, new woodland stands of trees um, to make pleasant vistas for those walking on the winding paths. And um, so here we have the sort of the detailed picture. And this is where he was going to build himself a very fine mansion on a spot which is thought to have been the location of an of a ancient dwelling. So how come he was able to do all this? He spent a lot on the land and then on all these improvements to make it into a country estate. And um, so he was one of the partners in this bank, but he, he'd been born in Chapel Allerton. And in fact, he owned, Nicholson owned Chapel Allerton Hall um, and then let it out. Um, but he went into partnership, came back into to Leeds um, and was in partnership with uh, William Williams Brown, also Chapel Allerton chap. And um, we think that the, the bank was built by Thomas Taylor um, and it's still there, the uh, slightly changed building, but still there in Commercial Street. We think that Thomas Taylor was also responsible for building the mansion in the park. Now, um, it was lived in by a succession of Nicholsons and you see that it was Thomas Nicholson and then it was his half brother and then a nephew. So why not the children? Well, because although Thomas Nicholson may have wished to found a dynasty and pass the, the land and all that was on it to the direct descendants, actually he had no children. Strangely enough, his half-brother had no children either. And then when it came to William Nicholson Nicholson, who had moved up to Leeds and um, to actually taken the surname Nicholson because he was a he was a, a nephew who was um, son of a, of a sister, so he hadn't got the right name. So he was able to inherit. But by the time he came here, he'd, um, he, was, he was married, he had some children. He had loads of children, but he also had three extremely troublesome and disappointing sons, the eldest of whom actually died before his father did. And there's an amazing story to tell, which Steve Burt tells incredibly well about how 
the, the next son disappeared off to New Zealand and married a New Zealand woman. Um, this is all in, in Steve Burt's book from 20 years ago about Round Hay Park. Uh, in brief, in brief, he tells it in a very colourful way. And then the, the next brother also went off to New Zealand and uh, teamed up with the same uh, <laughs> New Zealand woman. So um, I think Nicholson, uh, the father, um, w William, was um, extremely disappointed with what had happened. And um, in the end, his will just said, actually, my executors can do what they think fit with the estate. The four executors then actually didn't get on with um, selling the estate and splitting it up amongst the remaining family. And uh, Nicholson's widow had to take them to court. She took them to court of chancery, got a ruling in her favour, and then they had to, to put the estate on the market. So then um, in came the, um, the idea that Oh, well, if this is coming available, why couldn't this be a park for the people in this crowded, noisy, bustling, successful, but, you know, not very healthy town where people didn't have enough space to go and enjoy themselves on the little time when they weren't working. And so they called in the surveyor to go and sort out exactly um, what was for sale. And the uh, top auctioneer of the day, John Hepper, and uh, measured it all up. And the idea was that um, the, the auction would be held, but the, the, it was very much known that the mayor was wanting to bid for it on behalf of the town. But there were some very, there were various problems. So this, these were the lots, by the way, that he was particularly interested in. Lot 19, which you can just about make out on the, on the um, map here, and then lot 20 here. And by the way, the map, when it was found in uh, when when some surveyors in the 20th century were moving offices, they found this map and they had it digitally repaired. So those horrible creases have been magically removed. And you can buy copies of this map from the Friends of Round Hay Park, part of the way they raise money for doing all the wonderful stuff they do. So this is uh, showing off about how this park could be such a wonderful thing for the people of Leeds. Um, and this is uh, from the graphic in the year that it was opened. Uh, so we're slightly jumping ahead of ourselves here, but this is, you know, we're convincing people of uh, the fact that this was a good decision. Mm. A marvel indeed. These waterfalls are no longer there, by the way. Various things are, have been changed over the years and the waterfalls have, have fallen out of. Thank you. So anyway, the arguments against, well, led by the posh folk who'd gone and made their villas near this park and were not in favour of the working classes coming and disturbing their country peace. And because it was so far out of town, um, folks said, look, um, what about people who live right over across the other side of the borough, say in Bramley? You know, it's not going to be much cop for them, is it? Uh, and how would they get there? Because there was no public transport at this time. You know, it was there were a few horse buses and then there were various versions of trams, but not until the 1890s did we get the trams and that comes in a moment. And it was also actually it was outside the boundary of Leeds and it was going to they knew that the asking price was such that it was over the limit that the city council was empowered to spend on behalf of the people. So um, uh, quite formidable obstacles in the way of, of uh, proceeding. This is one of the people who objected, um, James Kitson, who, well, he was very successful by this stage as an engine builder down in Hunslow, but he, he'd been born in a pub um, and, uh, you know, very humble origins, but now he'd made it, he wasn't uh, very keen on, on other humble people coming and disturbing his peace. But the arguments for the park, which obviously won, um, as I'm, it's not exactly a plot spoiler, um, that it was a ready-made park. You know, any, any other piece of land, supposing such as existed, that was available on the market, would have had to be then turned into a park. Whereas this one came with all its wonderful um, features already in place. Um, and uh, actually the distance from Leeds was an advantage because it was well away from the smoke. I mean, it was said that, um, that, uh, that trees simply wouldn't grow in town uh, because they, they had their pores clogged up with smoke. And so really this was um, 
a much better bet to have the the park right out here yes um and it was part of um making the argument the the council commissioned john atkinson grimshaw to paint some very alluring pictures of the park it, see, it doesn't seem to have occurred to him that people might want to visit during daylight hours because all the paintings were guess what by moonlight but anyway i mean he managed to make it look extremely beautiful of course as was his wont um and this all helped to persuade people so during the months before the auction um, between 100 and 200,000 Leeds people were estimated to have visited the park. Barron thought it was a really good thing to persuade um, the locals to go and view it for themselves. So he persuaded the auctioneers to open it up to townspeople every Saturday during that year before the auction. A clever move, I think. Um, so uh, when it came to the day of the auction down at the Great Northern Railway Hotel, this is on Wellington Street, you can see the Queen's Hotel in the background there. And so this is uh, going for lot 19 as well as lot 20. And uh, it was no secret that um, Hepper was very much a supporter of um, Barron succeeding in, in getting this lot. But they, in, in Neville Herworth, in his uh, tale of how Barron got the park, uh, used uh, the Leeds Mercury reports uh, very uh, assiduously and uh, tells the blow by blow account of the auction. And it was obviously a nail, pretty nail biting time. You know, how high was the price going to go if there were other people bidding? But anyway, the, the mayor was able to uh, get what he'd gone for and he got lots 19 and 20, which he, he had to mortgage Chapel Allerton Hall in order to have the cash to pay down for this investment. Um, and then he immediately um, applied to the council to pay him back as soon as they could with interest when they managed to get a, an act of parliament to permit them to make this expenditure. But during this very quick, um, this, this short few months, he wasn't, they weren't able to, to push, put the act through to, to get the permission in time. So he had to go to the lengths of putting up his own money, risking his own money in order to do this. And again, the elite were trying to scupper the passage of the bill through parliament but it did succeed so then we had the invitation to prince arthur aged only 21 at the time to come and do the honors for opening the park and here you see the uh, uh all the serried ranks of the hussars to greet him uh he'd, he'd stayed at howard house overnight with Earl, Earl or harwood sorry um, and uh, here in the background, you can see, by the way, this is before the municipal buildings were built. So this scene captures what was there beforehand. And this is the statue of Wellington in the foreground. Wellington, whose statue was moved, by the way. There is precedent for moving statues. Later, there was a um, statue of Queen Victoria here that in turn was moved. So statues don't always stay put, just throwing that one in. And uh, then they had the grand procession up to the park followed by the, the mayor receiving um, the, the prince on the, the platform here and the, the crowds of dignitaries, the soldiers the, and, the, and the people all shouting in their glee that this great day had come. And then back to the town hall for, a, for dinner and a grand ball. And uh, John Barron's daughter, Lily, had the, had the honor of dancing with the prince. She didn't marry him, by the way. She married a Leeds chap uh, uh, about three years after this. But um, fortunately, the mayor had a suitable daughter to do the honours on the day. So, but, the, you know, the, the park was open. It was going to be a thing. But there then ensued some years of difficulty because there still wasn't a transport system. So um, this was... Uh, very difficult to solve and he, Baron was taunted about having got this park for the people who then you know couldn't get there very easily. Wagonettes, omnibuses and other vehicles were pressed into use and on holidays apparently many buses, horse buses this is, were diverted from other routes to serve the park. Um, and eventually in 1878, some unemployed men were put to work constructing a new section of road, which at least made it a, a better route to get there. And uh, that became Prince's Avenue. But uh, they were, sorry, I should have put that. Uh, they, they were 
taunted by uh, things such as this pamphlet um, and uh, it was um, suggested uh, that uh, uh, the people of Leeds had um, you know, put all this money up and then the land that, that, that was supposed to be sold off, as in the Bore Lane scheme, the land was supposed to be sold off to pay for the park, but it was very slow to shift and so um, uh, there was also a lack of facilities in the park as well. So lots of work still to do. And um, Baron had proposed a railway. It would have started down here in Templar Street and, by the way, would have served uh, what became St James's Hospital uh, and carried on up here to the park. And th this map also shows you just how far away the park was from the densely developed part of Leeds at the time. But... Baron didn't manage to get this to happen. He was so successful in so many ways, but the cost of putting in the line and then the cost of servicing it with all the stations to run and everything um, was not uh, thought to be worthwhile, uh, especially because it was only seasonal traffic or was going to be mainly seasonal. And there was also, by the way, demand for actually, while we're building, a, we need a line out to the northwest. Hmm, we never did get that, did we? Um, or indeed any um, modern rapid transit system, never mind. But we, we were going to get something very modern uh, if this had gone ahead, uh, a system that had recently been um, invented, uh, modelled on a, a Chicago elevated railway. And the idea was that this would bring uh, the populace rather rapidly up to the park but again, there were objections, the cost of putting it in, it was thought to be unsightly and it would be noisy. And so this one was scotched as well. Eventually there were trams. Now this shows the, 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 the most successful ones at the end of the experimenting with different sorts of trams, but um, there was a, a, a temporary solution with a tram company. Um, and then eventually the city council, the um, when it had become the city council, took over the system and electrified it. And they had the great um, accolade of being the first place to have electric trams with the overhead wires, the first place in Europe with these, with these cars. And um, so finally, the masses could get to the park. There's the mansion. And... Um, showing just how popular it was. It had been popular all along, but now they could get in more easily. And this is uh, people taking their perambulation beside the lake with the waterfalls. And when there was a, the a centenary celebration, this uh, phrase of Barron's was resurrected. How prescient he was and the Yorkshire Evening Post at the time said, and a hundred years hence, people will still be saying the same. And I wonder, you know, uh, will this park be uh, kept in good order and valued by the people of Leeds, um, even, even into, you know, 200 and more years ahead. So, um, so many uh, things have, have happened there. So many events, different kinds of sporting activities and more. So the arena was made at a place where old Nicholson, who'd bought the estate back in the early 19th century, had been intending to make a third lake, but actually that didn't come off. So um, poor man Nicholson had only lived there for three years, you know, before he died. So he didn't have time to put into practice all his plans. Anyway, I'm sure he would uh, have enjoyed seeing some of the things that have happened on this arena since then. So there have been... Um, all kinds of sporting activities straight away because it was the peak of the um, cycling mania at the end of the 19th century. So there were cycle races, uh, there was cricket and um, all sorts of other sporting activities. Um, then there was the military tattoo for a number of years and the Children's Day was very popular for two or three decades in the middle of the 20th century with um, uh, rather um, kind of spookily Nazi looking gym, gymnastics displays of youngsters, you know, showing off how fit they were. Um, but uh, then that fell out of favor and, uh, and that uh, occasion was stopped. But um, there's been the park run in Roundhay Park since 2011, and we've had the triathlon since 2016. So there are always new things coming along. 
um, where the park is a, a really good place for these things to happen. Here is a more informal sporting occasion uh, last evening after sunset already. And this was a, um, actually a, a birthday party. It was a, a family of, of Asian descent, clearly, when I got closer. And it was uh, celebrating a little girl's 11th birthday. And it was a mixed uh, boys and girls playing football down there by Waterloo Lake. I'm sure Baron would have been delighted to see that. Um, he might have not have been so delighted to hear some of the concerts again, you know, when this was first suggested, there was an outcry from the from the local residents. How could you possibly put on huge concerts and disturb our peace? But over the years, some very famous names have played there. Um, do you remember when Ed Sheeran came and uh, for this, days beforehand, there was incredibly heavy rain and uh, it did give up, though, in time for the concert and a different sort of loud noise happens uh, usually anyway in November. Um, started back in the 1970s, this um, event put on annually. And then other sorts of quieter celebrations. This was just the other day, an Eid picnic. And there were many groups of people in the park that day last week um, celebrating the Muslim festival. Um, so what a wonderful benefit this has been to so many people. And you see lots of comments on social media about it. Um, and uh, now there's uh, rowing happening on the on the lake uh, with youngsters learning their skills and doing competitive rowing against other schools and colleges. And here's somebody just saying, you know, they'd only just recently learned how significant our park is amongst European parks. Used, by the way, to quite often to freeze over in the early days, and this upper lake was used for skating. It's very shallow um, and was made even shallower deliberately so that the skating would be safer, whereas the lower lake is much deeper and isn't safe. It isn't safe. And there are warning signs telling you not to go in the water. After all the sad things that have happened over the last few days with people venturing into water, I hope that people take that warning seriously. So here we have um, the, the satellite image and the, uh, the, the map there showing you the extent of the park now. So many acres for our delectation and delight and very much managed by a partnership between the City Council and the extremely numerous friends of Roundhay Park who've done all sorts of works. They were founded back in the 1990s and now have hundreds of members and um, they have, have um, made new gardens and uh, uh, overseen uh, raising funds to upgrade the facilities and so on and so forth so it's been a great uh, a great partnership um the specialist gardens are just to the side of uh, the north side of the pub that's just on the edge of the park and here's the the garden that's like the one in the Alhambra uh, palace and then we've got a series of the gardens that were Chelsea medal winning gardens. This was the first one that won a, a gold medal back in 2010. Um, and uh, most of these gardens have something to do with conservation and water. And, uh, you know, they're, they're very natural looking. And even more so now they've been in the, in the park for a while and have sort of grown into their setting. So it's certainly worth seeing. So people uh, avail themselves of the park even during lockdown and during um, the winter. So socially distanced picnic there on New Year's Eve. Oh, sorry, that was a, that come up again. And uh, there's the um, the fountains on the upper lake last evening at sunset, which is really a really peaceful scene. Very few people around. Uh, although when you go down to the car park, still lots of cars, but people can spread out because it's such a large area. So how grateful we are to um, the man who became Sir John Barron late in his life, um, right, at, right uh, at the end of the 90s. Uh, and he was there amongst the leading men of his times. No women up there, if you see. Um, along with uh, Kitson, um, the, the younger who became Lord Airedale, and various other people whose, whose names we might recognize today. Um, Baron was certainly there as one of the party uh, celebrating the opening of the new Leeds Bridge. There he is. He was still mayor at the time when that was officially opened. And by the way, we'll be able to celebrate 150 years of the bridge during our cultural festival in 2023. I wonder if anybody's onto that one yet. 
civic trust. <laughs> um, so John Barron also had these other public roles. I, I mentioned at the beginning that he became MP and, and served a couple of um, terms. And uh, this painting, it won't surprise you, is by our oh, John Atkinson Grimshaw, by Moonlight. Um, and John Barron was also president of the Leeds Chamber of Commerce. He doesn't seem to have spoken many times in the house. Uh, you can see all the records in Hansard of, of how people contributed to debates, but he did speak up on matters of trade. So he was clearly the, the delegate for the business fraternity of Leeds, um, but more generally a, a liberal. And uh, his other public roles, well, he was a life governor and then became at the right at the end of his life, treasurer of the university at the time when it made the transition from being the Yorkshire College to being the university. And he got a, an a honorary degree along with these other great names. Um, two, two composers there amongst them. So I'm sure that they were all present together in one ceremony. But not long after that, he met the end of his life in his 84th year and was buried with some other members of his family. He was predeceased by his first wife. And after four years, he'd married again, and his, his second wife um, lived on after him. But he was predeceased by uh, three children, um, which is a great sadness, I'm sure. So although many things were a success for him, he, he knew grief that was shared by so many people in these times. His grave is in the non-conformist section of the Beckett Street Cemetery. There are Anglicans in one area and then all the non-conformists in another area. And as a Baptist, he is in the non-conformist area. He didn't want a statue. He specifically said he didn't want a statue, which I think says something about him. Um, but he did actually give himself this uh, useful monument to the park, who arranged for it to be hooked up to the water supply from Eckup and paid £3,000 of his own money. It was built by a local builder, Mr Myers, designed by his old friend Thomas Ambler and um, was uh, then used in uh, celebrating the centenary of the park with all these little children spontaneously running towards the evening post photographer. But um, sadly, it doesn't any longer function as a fountain, which is a great shame. Uh, one of the things that the uh, park has been doing recently, this um, an another of their collaborations, is encouraging people to gather tree seeds, which are then being grown into saplings at Arium, the City Council's uh, Parks Department facility on the northern edge of Leeds. And this is all helping towards our target for the, for the district of all these millions of trees over the next few years. So this is a wonderful living legacy. I hope Byron would have approved. So he came to the town at a time when tailoring employed fewer than a thousand people. And by the time he died, there were thousands of people employed, probably 20,000 people employed at the time of Barron's death, and it went on to grow even further to the peak just before the Second World War. And whereas he was one of the biggest players of his time, other players then overtook him. And uh, extraordinary thought that he was the person who started off the whole business of ready-made clothing through first investment in the sewing machine and then in the band knife and drawing on the excellent um, skills of the people who are used to working with textiles to make this the premier area for making of garments, you know, from a place that hadn't been any more focused on garments than anywhere else in the country when Baron arrived. So he was there in the forefront. And this is the, a copy, the, the cover of this book that uh, was written about the firm at the, um, in the middle of the 20th century. Um, and just the, the note there about uh, how it fared afterwards. So there are copies of that book in the Leeds uh, University Library and in the Leeds Library on Commercial Street. It's a curious artefact. So there's Baron. What, what can we say about him? The man, his character, his qualities, his modus operandi. Um, I think he was a, a serious gentle man in the best sense intelligent, no doubt, ingenious, certainly, sober. <clears throat> this is um, 
Elder Flower Cordial. As a Baptist, he was a lifelong teetotaler. He was a creature of his time, but he also had foresight and was a maker of the times, I would say. He was groundbreaking, thinking of how to do things more efficiently, how to attract more customers, but with compassion for the workforce. So it wasn't just wealth at any price. He wasn't exploitative. I mean, no doubt now, you know, looking back at the hours that his staff had to work and other aspects of their their working conditions and lives, you know, we would still say it left a lot to be desired. But compared with other employers of the time, he was certainly more considerate. One of the few employers who, when giving evidence to a royal commission in 1864, appealed for working hours of young girls to be reduced. That's mentioned in the centenary book about the firm. He was certainly daring in his, in his moves, in his investments, and when the moment was right. So it's not about, you know, having an appetite for risk. It's about being good at spotting opportunities and doing, you know, the risk assessment that um, comes out on the side of something that is going to stand a strong chance of working. So whether it was with his shops, number one, Brigitte, number one, Bore Lane, with his factories, Alfred Street, then Park Row, then St. Paul Street, and then Chorley Lane. Um, he was, he, you know, he'd made those decisions to expand, to do things differently. Um, and at the same time as taking on this, this civic load, you know, so for more than half a century, he was engaged in civic ways, um, had a sense of, of paying back. And he wasn't full of his own importance, it seems to me, that he was a, a man who, who got things done. He didn't throw his weight around, but he, he just worked conscientiously and determinedly to make things happen. And the fact that he didn't want a public statue and said as much, I think, you know, that, that is, I think, very telling. So I wish we could have a birthday cake that um, was perhaps in the form of St Paul's house and maybe we, we were 200 candles like the minaret, so that would probably be a bit much and I'm not sure how any cake maker could do the fiddly work required to make it look, <laughs> look right, but anyway, I think he, he, he'd certainly deserve it. And see, he came to Leeds as a young man in the early Victorian period, played such a prominent part in commercial and civic life until the end of, uh, uh, well, just after Victoria's reign had ended. And I think he's amongst one of the most deserving of the blue plaque recipients. So this is uh, just to show you some of my main sources, just to show I haven't made it all up. <laughs> and uh, it's been enormous fun doing this. I'm preparing for the tours that I'm about to do. So yeah, sorry, I couldn't remember whether I said two o'clock or two thirty, but um, we're we're um, doing two on Sunday, and with an optional picnic in the middle. So the idea is that the people who come with me in the morning could stay on um, and have a picnic, and people who are coming in the afternoon could, if they like, come early and join us for the picnic. Um, I took the precaution of uh, of uh, setting the start somewhere where there is one of those lovely shelters with the seats, but actually the weather forecast has improved. So the rain has disappeared from the forecast at this stage, but you know, the things can change again. However, I'm, I'm moderately hopeful that it will be fine. And then looking a little further ahead to the beginning of the autumn, I'm going to do two sessions on Sunday afternoon. So the Sunday, the 3rd of October will be just before the 150th anniversary of the nail biting auction at uh, the Great Northern Hotel, where Hepper put Brown Tay Park under the hammer. So that's uh, the end of my talk, and uh, I think I shall stop sharing my screen now and come back to yes. sit beside Roderick, <laughs> as it were. <laughs> well, thank you for that, Rachel. That was a, a fascinating talk, and I, <clears throat> I've certainly learned an awful lot from listening to it. Um, I think you've stunned the, the chat into, into more or less silence, because there's been very little coming in on the chat. I hope it isn't because they're all asleep over their gin and tonics. <laughs> <laughs> one lady who's coming to one of your walks this weekend, another gentleman who was at the Rolling Stones concert. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, that's and, fantastic. And, thanks for, and various messages of thanks from people. Lovely. Um, it, last week, I, I, I was looking at the, uh, the second blue plaques volume and I did notice that there are more index entries for John Barron in the, in, in the index than for anybody else who, who, who appears in the book. 
So, you know, can you, would you like to sort of finish perhaps by just an idea of how significant he is compared to other of his contemporaries? He certainly left a large park and some large buildings, but you know, his, his significance well, I think it was it was the reach, wasn't it? So, you know, the fact that he was involved in business and in civic life and, um, you know, this this wonderful um, phenomenon of, of the park, which I think is the, the crowning glory in terms of his civic contribution. So, um, you know, he, he and he kept at it. So he knew everybody at the top of of business and culture and so on in Leeds throughout his his working life here so you know he he was um no no wonder he's then cross-referenced so many times in the blue tax book because he was there at big events he was part of other people's um life life stories wasn't he mm. as this as this great uh, uh as a business figure and civic figure so i think yes he's really amongst the most deserving of the of the blue plaque uh, but, but, but there is one question on, on the chat which you may be able to answer just what garments did the firm make in the first world war oh that's i don't no. know it doesn't it doesn't actually say in in the centenary book by the firm about the firm as far as i remember but i do know that a lot of leeds clothing firms went over to making uniforms didn't they uh, but I don't, I don't know whether that's the case with Barons. Um, maybe I'll find that out if I if I look up um, in Katrina's book. Maybe I'll find out something about that. Sorry about that one. Well, yeah, well, thank you. But anyway, um, I think we'll leave it there. Thank you again for a really fascinating talk. There were several messages of thanks on 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 the chat about the presentation. Oh, lovely! Um, this is. Um, uh, as somebody who's new to Leeds hasn't yet had a chance to visit the park. Well, I hope I've um, given you the idea, Stephanie, that it's definitely worth going there, and and many times, you know, it's sort of so lovely at different times of year. Um, oh well, the walk. Ah, yeah. you've got to go on to Eventbrite to see where it starts. So if you just if you look me up, um, uh, Leeds City Walking Tours, and you can see at the at the top of the screen it says to book a tour. And uh, so I don't usually advertise where the tours start. Uh, so that I don't get loads of people just randomly <laughs> turning up. <laughs> you'll you'll understand that, I'm sure. I've been there when I was leading a walk and two people turned up just on spec. But um, we well, this is this is me trying trying to make a living. I know people can show themselves round round Hay Park, but I you know for all my uh, tours, mostly they're locals. Especially this last year, most people coming on tours have been locals. And um, I often find it really lovely that people who have lived in Leeds for many years and sometimes all their lives say, well, um, we've learned a lot today. And I, I feel very um, privileged to be able to do the, you know, pulling all the material from the different sources and then, uh, you know, telling it back to people in a way that's palatable and interesting mm. uh, and pinning it to the places on the ground. And so I often um, now will do both the online uh, uh, pr presentations and the real walking tours because you can do different things with both so there's so much more to to learn about the park and and more to understand about um, you know where baron was and the influence that he had down in town so i do encourage others to come along well i don't think there are any more questions on the chat but somebody has put a, the link to your own Oh, right. Thank you very much. OK. I don't know whether he's your PR agent or... Uh, well, yes, he does help. He's, he took some of the photographs as well, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yes, and I think there's a question there which, which is about your, your, your walking tours business. Um, um, yes, uh, about the, the, the dark arches below the station. Well, the dark arches come into several of the tours, actually, yeah. Stephanie, um, depending on the, the topic, but I often do take newcomers to Leeds there because <clears throat> it is most extraordinary, isn't it? A, a unique space, I think we could say. Anyway, I think we'll draw it to a halt there. So I'll okay. just thank you again on, on behalf of the Civic Trust and everyone who's been listening to this talk. Um, I hope that in a few days time that, that a link to a recording will be sent to all those who've, who've attended um, and the ones who booked up, who, who booked to come and couldn't attend. Um, so we'll be able to look at it all over again and listen to it all over again. So many thanks, Rachel, for that talk and many thanks to those present who've been listening to 
um, a superb introduction to Sir John Barron and his, his life and his works. So thank you. Okay, lovely, thanks. <laughs>